Yeah. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us here at the World Economic Forum. We're talking about workers in focus. My name is Jamie Heller. I'm the business editor of the Wall Street Journal. And I'd like to introduce uh, the other members of our panel here. Judith Weiss. Weiss. Forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> Chief People and Sustainability Officer and member of the Managing Board at Siemens. Christy Hoffman, who's a General Secretary of UNI Global Union, Switzerland. And Duncan Crabtree, Ireland, who comes to us from Los Angeles, uh, National Executive Director, Chief Negotiator at the Screen Actors Guild, American Federation of Television and Radio Artists which I think to say is you've been the chief labor advocate for the actors in Hollywood. Yes, that's, uh, that's, that's, a, fair, that's a fair statement. Fair, fair <laughs> summary. Uh, so I appreciate everyone being here, and we'll talk for a bit and then, and then turn it over and, and turn it into a Q&A. Um, technological progress has always marched on. It's really nothing new, but we have quite a few prognosticators saying that what we're facing right now is different. It's happening faster, it's affecting more people, different types of people, and it's like nothing the world has ever seen. And so what does it mean for workers? There's been quite a few prognostications. And Christy, I just want to start with you. Do, you. do you think this is like a whole different level or is this just more of the same the world's been through before? Kind of of two minds about that, because on the one hand, over the past 10 years, since you know, there's been a lot of technological change at work with um, algorithmic management and a whole series of digital uh, changes that have already changed the world of work. So to some extent, we've already seen some things happening. Um, and then on the other hand, Gen AI presents opportunity to really change work, but I don't think we've seen it in action in too many industries yet. Um, you know, we've seen there's a big study about call centers. Of course, there's the creatives, and I'll let Duncan talk about that, how it might be used um, in, in those industries. But otherwise, it's still at a little bit of a, you know, try it out stage. And I know the predictions are for, you know, 40% of all job tasks could be affected. But that's you know, we've heard that prediction 10 years ago in connection with digitalization. So I'm a little bit of a skeptic, but willing to, you know, embrace that that may be true. Um, I think, you know, it will be, it'll, it will be big. I don't disagree with that it will be big, but I also would be a little more cautious than saying we're seeing it everywhere because not so much with Gen AI. Yeah. Yet. yet, yet. And, and in terms of the yet, do you have any view of, okay, we're, Last year, Davos, ChatGPT, and now it's, okay, what's really going to happen here? But do you have a sense that things might accelerate faster than in other technological shifts, or you're still a little skeptical? No, I, I think it will. And, and I think algorithmic management, you know, it was very intense. There's been a lot of debate about that, but it doesn't really make add productivity. It's really just, you know, making workers go harder and faster. It doesn't really give that augmentative, it doesn't augment the worker in the same way that Gen AI does. So I think it will be bigger than some of the technology we've seen over the past 10 years. But, you know, we still have seen a lot of it creeping in, right. um, in, in fairly big ways in some industries. Duncan, you just went through a historic labor movement in Hollywood. You were with the actors, but it was the writers and actors kind of together. Um, what is your assessment of AI? Is it like, wow, this is coming on Fast and Furious, or just like, oh, it's just another issue in the negotiations? No, I mean, it was a really important issue in our negotiations. And I think our members and, and all of us recognize that generative AI in particular um, has already started to be used as it relates to actors mm -hmm. in our industry. So I don't disagree with anything that Christy just said, but I think that our members are going to, in particular, be on the cutting edge or the tip of the spear in this area, especially voice actors, as an example, because the technical requirements of using generative AI with voice only are easier, and that makes it faster and simpler to implement. And that's why it's been so crucial. I mean, just last week at the Consumer Electronics Show CES in Las Vegas, we announced a new agreement with a company called Replica Studios specifically about putting protections in place for voice actors who are going to work through digital replication and video games. And so um, I do think it's going to have a significant 
uh, impact and presence in our, in the creative industries in general, in film, television, video games, the industries our members work in, music industry as well. But I think one of the things that's so important for us to all remember, and our members talked about this all 118 days on the picket line last year, is decisions about the implementation of AI are not being made by AI, they're being made by humans. These are things we can decide. And it doesn't have to just be corporate executives who make that decision. This is a decision we should all make together. Workers should have an important role in participating in that decision making and society should have an important role in that. And I think the creative industries are one example of an area where you know, if we don't have that kind of human-centered approach to the implementation of AI, we run the risk of really losing the heart and soul of the creative industries the whole, their whole race on that. So I think that it is really important to recognize we bear responsibility for those decisions and we have control over them. Do you feel, you actually had to take to the picket line to get corporations to come to the table on that. So in your heart, do you feel like the leadership of big companies are on board with that assessment? Because I mean, obviously, you had to strike to get them to talk to you about it, no, among you're, other issues. You're right. You're absolutely right. I mean, I, I hope that this is evolutionary. And I hope that other big companies see what happened and learn from it, frankly, because the reality is, yes, those companies didn't want to talk to us about AI on June 7th when we started. But when we went on strike and, you know, when we were on strike for almost two, around two months before those conversations started, it became evident that that was that had to happen. And the CEOs of those companies came to the table and had those conversations with us, which is not the norm. You know, in our industry, it's much more common for other types of execs to do that negotiating. The CEOs came to the table because it was obvious that this had to be addressed. And in the end, we have 16 pages of our agreement that are about AI. And I firmly believe that two and a half years from now, we'll look back at this. And those companies will say, yeah, you know, these are things we have been able to work with. This hasn't hampered us. And our members will say, this is what gave us the level of trust and confidence to be able to come back to work even with this technology in place. So I hope that other companies learn from that experience and say, you know, we should talk to our employees, we should talk to our workers and do this together instead of forcing this kind of disruption. That, our strike, you know, our strike along with the Writers Guild, because as you mentioned, it's both of us, I mean, this strike costs the industry more than six and a half billion dollars. Um, and in a lot of ways, it wasn't necessary. A lot of ways, this could have been worked out without it, but in other ways, it couldn't, because the companies weren't ready until we got to that point, until they tested our resolve. And now, hopefully, others will learn from that. I mean, Judith, as someone in business, do you, do you think companies are um, going to learn from something like this? Or I mean, there's so much tantalizing uh, held out about how much productivity they're going to save from all this new technology. And, and how much of the conversation do you think there will be? Well, it's very hard to generalize for, for every business out there. And I think there are some, some cultural differences that enterprises choose, but also maybe some cultural differences in terms of where, where, you're, where you traditionally grew up as a business. If I, you know, as a, as a Germany headquartered business, um, Siemens has, has a long tradition of social partnerships with Works Council, with the unions. Um, we do a lot of things very proactively together. Um, Siemens has a, a history of 30 years in industrial AI. Um, so generative AI is new for us, but, but AI as such is, is not. And we have a workforce um, that spans from people on the shop floor through to 1,400 AI experts um, in the company and everything in between. So therefore, I agree, A, with I think we need to segment the workforce in terms of how much is going to be impacted, both in terms of activities that, that could be falling wayside from a, from a productivity efficiency perspective, but there's going to be a lot of complementarity mm. that AI brings to, to roles. Take, um, take coding, you know, take software developers. There's going to be a lot of complementarity um, that, uh, that AI is going to bring to those roles. Um, and for us, it's really exciting. And for our customers, it's really exciting. Because if you think about a shop floor environment, it really allows you know, the, um, your robots to come out of the cage because you can now speak with them. Uh, you can now program them there and then. And so for us, it's, it's an 
evolution um, in, in many regards um, of what we've done, but I do think that the speed of what comes at us is going to be, is going to be much faster than what we have seen with digitalization mm -hmm. um, in general. And if I could just give you um, one very, very pragmatic example of what we've done together with our works councils. We've developed something that we call AI cards. So we actually try to provide transparency on, on where AI is, is baked into the process, is baked into a tool, so that we really create some transparency early on, um, on how, how technology finds its way into workflows, into skills, et cetera, et cetera, so that we can proactively think about the impact and whether whether or not there is something to be mitigated. So you talk about these affecting jobs across the spectrum, including white collar. And Christy, do you feel like sort of the intelligentsia is a little more up in arms about this because it's a little more personal than it, than it had been before? Well, I, I mean, I just, I come from manufacturing originally, and of course we were dealing with negotiating around new technology a lot in the 80s, let's say, when it was really coming in, and there was a lot of alarm at that point. Um, and then having seen digitalization creeping along, I agree, it's, it's been rather slow, despite all the alarming uh, predictions some years ago. Um, there's a bit of that sort of the media being extremely hyped about it because it is the, the higher professions. But I would argue, you know, the, the most, some of the workers who are actually um, heavily impacted by Gen AI right now are in low page uh, call center workers. It's the mm -hmm. first big study. And I think, you know, the, the author of that study is here in, in Davos. Um, is call center workers where they've been using a GPT and large language um, model for a few years. And so they can take a look at that and, and see what the impacts have been. Um, and bank workers in banks who aren't necessarily the intelligentsia. So right. it isn't only hitting the, you know, the lawyers of the world. Um, I think, you know, graphic design artists, for example, they're not necessarily that, you know, if you were a freelance graphic design artist, you know, you're worried about where are you going to get, where are you going to make money right now? So we see it in our industries. I mean, I represent a lot of white collar workers in finance and IT and, um, in, in customer service, broadly speaking, which will be probably one of the hardest hit numerically sectors of the economy. Um, and by hardest hit, maybe not, and to some extent, you know, some of the, the call agents like the complementary of the AI, the customers are happier and fewer people yell at them. So there, are, there have been a lot of upsides that we've observed, but we just want to make sure that it's implemented in a way that has guardrails to respect their health and safety in terms of how much faster, you know, how, how fast they have to work and also um, that the gains are shared. You know, what we don't want to see is sort of exacerbating inequality by getting these productivity bumps from some low wage workers, some higher wage workers, but none of it, it really, the bottom line. you know, it, it just doesn't end, go to remunerate them. You know, with that increase in productivity, workers should get some share of that gain. So, so that's another concern we have, is that where does it go? Where, you know. So let's talk about what labor can and should be negotiating for, whether it's in like conversations or more antagonistic situations, because I've seen everything from uh, we're going to like meet every two years to discuss, and then, then there's also you all, you got some specific things about compensation, right? So can you, why don't you start us off, Duncan, like what are the range of things and what do you, like in your experience, how ambitious should labor be in these <laughs> discussions? Well, I think you should be as ambitious as you need to be in order for your workers that you represent to feel confident that they are in a work environment that respects them and where it's safe for them to do this work. And I think I say safe for them to do this work intentionally because one of the great fears that workers have with generative AI is just full-on replacement of their role. And so um, I don't think that fear is always justified, but it is often present and needs to be addressed. And uh, so that's something that we obviously uh, con you know, considered in framing our proposals. The, the concepts that we really built around it, and some of this is more specific to the life of a performer, had to do with what we called informed consent and fair compensation. And informed consent really revolves around the fact that when you're talking about performers, you're talking about using someone's image 
likeness, voice, or a performance that they created. And so there is a, um, you know, th that is a unique experience to have your face or voice used in that way. And, uh, you know, I'm someone, I've worked at, this, at the union for 23 years. I experienced this myself during our ratification campaign for this contract. Someone created a deep fake of me um, arguing against the ratification of our contract, which obviously I did not agree with, seeing as how I had negotiated it and was strongly encouraging people to ratify it. And, you know, it's one thing to talk about it intellectually. It's another thing to see your own face and your own voice saying things that you don't believe. And so those are the kind. so I, I guess what I would say in response to your question is, this is specific to each type of industry, each type of worker, what's important to them and what affects them most needs to be addressed. And that's why it should be a dialogue with employers and workers so that those specific needs get get um, taken care of. And you know, in, in the beginning of your question, you said you know this could be confrontational or it could be more dis more of a discussion. It should be more of a discussion. I mean, I I'll be the first to say, I mean, going on strike, having that kind of environment isn't the best way to reach um, an agreement or a consensus. And you know, um, and I think the idea of the kind of German model of uh, industrial relations is wonderful. Sadly, we don't have that largely in the United States, so that's not our experience. But we did start out trying to negotiate this. We spent 35 days bargaining over these terms before a strike was ever called. And I think you know that should always be the first hope, is to resolve these things through negotiation and discussion. Not every, no one gets everything they want, but you actually find that path. That's the goal. And But if it doesn't work, then at least in the United States, our remedy for that is industrial action, our right to strike, and obviously sometimes you have to use it. And Duncan brings up the idea of feeling replaced, but Christy, you don't feel that's like that big of an imminent threat right now? Is no, right? I, 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 imminent with the workers we represent, probably not, mm -hmm. but I don't, I don't say we won't eventually have some displacement. I think, right. you know, clearly in, in the industries I represent, it's more likely to be a, an attrition or, you know, a, a, um, not a like, let's lay off 5,000 workers and suddenly replace them with a bot. I don't see that happening. But I, I, you know, I think there will be ultimately some displacement of some workers. There's no question about that. But in terms of what we would argue, you know, should be like foundational in any bargaining, you know, first of all, there's notice, which you would see that in almost every uh, agreement on technology, is that the union, the worker, should be put on notice that there's a plan to implement new technology, some transparency, whether it's 90 days or longer, some ability to engage in assessing what are the risks to health and safety, to replacement, to job security, what training is needed. Um, what, who gets, you know, who's assigned to work with the new technology, all of those things, including, you know, if it's an algorithm, is it going to be, um, you know, discriminatory? Is, is that baked into the algorithm? And how much surveillance? And surveillance is really among all the issues right now for that, that workers I represent face, it's the, um, the surveillance, which has become so uh, intense, especially since around 2019. You know, the surveillance tools have really grown. So we negotiate no nonstop surveillance, no surveillance for purposes of discipline or all kinds of guardrails on surveillance. But I do think nonstop surveillance is inherently uh, unsafe. And we've negotiated with even global employers on, on um, surveillance. But I, I think the no, but going back to the basic framework is really about getting notice, getting a risk assessment, and then sitting down and talking about how you're going to manage those risks. And um, you know, we want workers to embrace technology and think it's great. And for some, it will make their jobs a lot more fun and more creative and get rid of the, the crappy, you know, tasks that they don't really enjoy doing. And, you know, th that could be the upside, is the jobs could actually be better. Um, but I think, again, with in an environment where they're not afraid, that they're gonna that there are all these other negative consequences. So that's the purpose of having that bargaining, which I recognize in, in Europe, that's kind of baked into your model and um, and not everywhere in Europe. I think specifically in Germany with co-determination. But in, in the US and in many other countries, it really involves having collective bargaining explicitly. I think, I mean, in the US it seems almost like a bifurcated economy because this is very low unemployment. 
and we had over 20 work, major work stoppages, stoppages, stoppages last year, um, and a lot of very successful ones. But at the Wall Street Journal, we were writing about layoffs every day, and like thousands, and you, I'm sure you all saw Citibank is gonna reduce by 20,000 people, so you know, these, these profit pressures are real, and like 90 days is good, but if you lose your job at the end, like that's tough. So I mean, what, what are you putting into place at Siemens to try to do the best you can to preserve opportunities for people and keep people? Yeah, and I, and I think that's, that's a really important point because I think it does depend on what your starting point is, yeah? whether you want a purely transactional relationship with, with your people or whether you think that you're actually in it together for the long run. I mean, Siemens has, has been around for 176 years. Um, we, we want a long-term relationship with our people and we want to make them successful we, because we think our, our success depends upon the, the collective capabilities that we have in the organization as well. So our starting point is that we want this to be um, a mutual relationship for, for the long run. And so, so therefore, we, what we're trying to do, and I think this is also part of, of my role for, as people in organization, is, is to help anticipate and to then also be transparent about trends and developments that we see. And not everything will lead to job security for everyone all the time. But I think um, the more that you can be prepared and the more that you can prepare people for this, um, I think that the more chances you have of, of actually making this mutually successful. And if you think about other challenges that, that are out there and, and that hit different countries in different ways, demographic change is one of them. In Germany, we're going to lose 15% of the workforce by 2035. Now, AI is not going to heal all of that, but it is a contributing factor to mitigating that. And so for me, it's all about, you know, where can we invest in people's capability, yeah, so that we can take them with us on that, uh, on that new technological journey, and where can we also, you know, use retirements, etc., uh, to phase out. And I think the more you have tools and practices around really being able to anticipate that and plan for that together, um, the better. I give you a very specific example um, around AI. We have, a, we have a methodology that we call Nextwork that really helps sites, helps parts of functions, helps parts of the business to project however long they can see, maybe three to five years about what does this part of the organization um, need in terms of capability, what kind of shifts do they see, how much of that do they think they can develop, how much of that do they think they need to buy off the market, and, and do they see a population going into retirement as well. And then we translate that into learning paths for people. Yeah? And partly we've even invested into, into truly adult education and gone all the way out to, to reskill people. That is not always necessary, but, but a certain degree of upskilling is. And there is a business case to that as well. Yeah? Um, right. uh, and, and of course, it relies on the fact that you know, people are willing to learn. Um, and we will have to do that yeah, for 45, 50 years in careers. And this is where technology, like AI, does put a different spin on things. Yeah? Um, shelf life of knowledge is what, five, ten years? Mm -hmm. um, so we will need to train that muscle of learning together um, in a safe place um, uh, for, you know, for much more than, than we maybe ever have, have done. And the more we can lower the, um, the barriers um, of, of doing that and getting into the habit of, um, What kind better. of barriers? Well, I mean, the, the longer Attitude. you are in a role, um, you know, the, the more mm -hmm. you probably feel threatened by things that change that role significantly. If, if you keep on your toes, if you keep learning, if there's an environment that induces that, um, I think the, the preparedness for things that come are, are much, much greater. So we very often talk about resilience and relevance, you know, because very often we just talk about the technical functional skills. We don't talk about the readiness. And, and I think there is increasingly a realization that we need to invest in skills like learning to learn, adaptability, creativity, um, collaboration. Those are the things that will equally prepare people um, for, for a career that is meaningful um, and that will keep people relevant um, for the job market. And quite honestly, if they're relevant for the job market, the likelihood that they're relevant for Siemens is, is pretty high. How um, would you grade corporate, global corporations on doing what you're saying they should be doing? Sorry, say that again. How would you grade global corporations on leading in the way you're saying they should be leading? 
I, I, I think as always, yeah, and I think COVID was a totally different example of showing the good and the bad. Um, I think that there is a lot of companies out there who, who, who are very, very vested into their workforce and where there is no antagonistic relationship at all. Um, and then, of course, there, there, are, there are companies and there are people who will go for the next dollar um, to the next place. Yeah? So I think, it's, I think you, will, you will have a, a, a complete bifurcation here as well um, in terms of the, the really good ones and the, and the really not so good ones. Do you want to jump in on that? I mean, I, no, I, I agree with you. I, I mean, we see, for example, in finance, you just pointed out Citibank laid off workers. I mean, um, the workers in the US in, finance, in banking don't have a union, and so we're not as close to the granularity of, of their, their situation, but in Europe they do. And they've been going through job losses for a very long time because, you know, of, there's e-banking has been the, the cause of it, not, not AI, but not generative AI. But the employers have been, you know, it, and again, I'm talking really more about Europe, but very eager to do, there's been a lot of retraining, there's a lot of bit early retirements, attrition. I mean, there's all kinds of ways of reducing the workforce, which they've had to do. I think they've lost during a 10 year period, something like 300,000 jobs. But gradually, and it wasn't, it was done with really thoughtful um, exchanges and, and figuring out who wants to upskill. I mean, not everybody okay. does. A lot of people took early retirement. And we see this now also retail, like people who sell fashion in, a, you know, an H&M or a Zara or any, you know, their jobs are completely different now than from what they were five years ago. They have to, or maybe eight years ago, but you know, they really have to have digital skills. They have to be able to look and see, is this in another store? Can I order this? Can I take the returns? It's a completely different job than it was when you go and you pick what you want and you pay at the cashier. Um, and so, um, and some of the, some people were, oh, I don't really want to learn all that, but mostly the willingness to really get into the digital skills that you need to have to even be in, in retail right now are pretty strong and most of the companies are very eager to retrain because, you know, loyalty, culture, and sort of valuing your, your staff. I, I think that's a, an important um, feature of good employers. And we've a lot seen of a fair enough of that to, um, to recognize that, you know, it's, it's not the, you know, it's not the edge, you know, it, it is more common than, than you might think. And I think there's something important around terminology as well, because one of the things that we started to shift is to go from job security to um, employability, you know? um, because job security pretends like you can you can protect something forever and and keep it unchanged which of course is totally unrealistic employability means you know if 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 we agree that we're vested you know then then we can make sure that that the proposition you you have yeah and that you personify is is something that is is going to be meaningful going forward and i think that's a very different conversation because rather than protecting jobs, you're actually enabling people. And, and for me, that changes um, the game. And, and we have had a really good conversation with our social partners um, about this in Siemens as well to get there. And, um, and we even, um, you know, that there are even projects that we do together with the Works Council where we fund um, parts of the workforce that come to us and say we would like to be invested in. You know? so, so we even do this together. And I think that builds trust as, as, as well. You know? I'm going to turn to the audience in one second, but I just want to ask Duncan, like, what is it like talking with other labor leaders in the U.S. right now? Are, like, the UAW just came off quite a successful, also relatively long, but quite a successful outcome. Are you all like chaining information now? Like, what are, <laughs> how are you? How are you looking yeah. into 2024? Like, and what is the learning from quite quite a number of strikes across a wide array of industries? Yeah, I mean, there's always, you know, there's always been a collaboration. I mean, there's a, called the labor movement for a reason, but we have definitely been trying to just work together better than ever. Certainly in the industry that I work in, the media and entertainment industry, the unions in our industry are united and collaborating in ways that has never happened before. And frankly, it was actually kicked off by the pandemic and the need for us to work super closely to try and bring the industry back 
from a state, the industry was shut down for six months in the, the United States. All the rules about safety and testing. Exactly, and, and that gave us a chance to really build that skill set of collaboration, and that has continued on. And so the Teamsters, the IA, the crew, the crew unions are set to negotiate this year, and they certainly are counting on, and they will, they can expect to receive the full support of SAG-AFTRA and the other unions that negotiated this year. So yeah, absolutely. And I do think that we all recognize, and we just had a, a summit on this topic last week, as I mentioned at CES in Las Vegas, and um, I think we're all very clear on the importance of really looking down the road as this technology comes, seeing where it's headed, and working together with employers to put um, contracts together that can actually allow the employers to do what they need to do. And, you know, workers want to work. They want to have jobs. They want their employers to be successful. I'm sure Siemens workers are, you know, the core of Siemens success. And, and that's true for all of these businesses. So workers want to work together, like Christy said, with employers, but they also have to feel respected and they have to be respected. And so as AI comes forward, that's what we have to do. Just bring it in, focus on the human-centered nature of it, and remember that ultimately AI should serve us, not the other way around. So if we can make that work, then I think there's a very bright future for worker and employer um, collaboration with respect to AI. Anybody in the audience here? Uh, we could just say who you are and... Uh, they're putting the mic on, sorry. I caught them by yeah. surprise, thanks. It's better now, yeah. I'm Francisco Camacho, I work for FEMSA, which is a global retailer and um, soldering bottler with over 300,000 collaborators. Um, but I guess that the question is for Siemens specifically because 170 years is a lot. And uh, in 170 years, I mean, there have been a lot of transformations. I mean, if you go back in time, I mean, for, I guess that uh, from electricity, I guess that, I don't know. I mean, it's a bunch Telegraph. of Telegraph. Uh, telegraph, and telegraph and not to mention a bunch of others and <laughs> and um, Siemens is still there and, and providing jobs and I guess that beyond what is happening punctually right now which can be artificial intelligence today just as it was internet a few years ago will you mention could you mention two or three principles that companies could follow to um, keep providing uh, the jobs but at the same time growing as, as a corporation because I think that 170 years has proven to be, whatever you are doing is proven to be successful. <laughs> yeah, I, I, th I, think one of the, I think one of the successes of Siemens is, is clearly the passion for technology. Yeah, so, so rather than letting other people inventing new technology, I think we've, we've always been at the forefront of that as well. Um, I have to say that we have not always been super successful in commercializing that in the way that we should. I think Siemens claims to have invented the internet. Um, but, um, but clearly, yeah, we, we have always been there in terms of building great technology and bringing that to customers. I think that's the other thing. We understand customer industries and technology, and I think that combination has made us really, really strong. But even if I, if I go to, to you know, our, something that is more closely to our topic today, I think Siemens, like some of the great companies that are as old as we are, has always been strong in social innovation as well. You know? So if I think about things like um, benefits uh, for, for people, um, education for people, I think Siemens started their first apprentice, type of apprentice program in 1898. Yeah, so, so these things are deeply, deeply ingrained in the culture um, and, uh, and the culture of, of, of really, you know, caring for people without being too paternalistic, I think, today, yeah, in, in terms of culture shift. But the, but the commitment that, you know, that people and technology go together, I think that is very, very deeply ingrained. Um, and I think today what we need to be mindful of, of is the speed by which um, things change and to what extent uh, things um, are tipped into very different type of, of, of business models um, as well. So what we're discussing today a lot is how do you, how do you actually orchestrate ecosystems um, much, much more. And, and that comes with very, very different business models to the past as well. So, but, but those are, I think those are part of the DNA that has, that has made us strong and that will, that will hopefully secure another 176 years easily as well. I saw your, C your CEO at CES on television. Yes. You delivered the opening speech. Hmm? 
Is there, are there any other questions or comments? Here, just let us know who you are. And Hi, my name is Dan Biederman, <clears throat> affiliated with the Schwab Social Entrepreneurship Group here. Um, my work has largely been with workers in supply chains, uh, and currently we're doing venture capital to help build sustainable and um, resilient supply chains. And I guess it's a little bit of a diversion from the topic you've all been discussing, but the vast majority of workers don't have representation from unions and don't work for responsible multinationals. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you want to make sure either you work with your suppliers or other partners or with other actors such that the kinds of concerns that you're articulating here optimistically can be resolved in the US and elsewhere can also be uh, at least addressed or, or not completely disruptive in parts of the world where supply chains have been essential to economic growth, economic development. Can I, if I may, Dan, I think that's a great question. I'm really glad you asked it because one of the things we hadn't touched on yet was sort of how you do put together a comprehensive set of protections for people because there are and always will be some people outside of the coverage of collective bargaining or with employers who maybe aren't that responsible or who are affected by this technology outside of the regular employment relationship. And so from my point of view, there's sort of, there's a mosaic that's needed. Collective bargaining is one part of that mosaic, but public policy is another very important part. I know, you know, in the United States, we've been working very hard to try and move things forward. Obviously, the EU has been doing quite a lot on uh, AI, and I think that um, that is gonna be absolutely essential. Um, just as one example, um, the deep fake that I mentioned that was made of me, that wasn't done by an employer, it wasn't done by anyone I had a contractual relationship with at all, and yet it was very abusive. And our members have suffered that in terms of deep fake pornography for a number of years using the earliest iterations of this type of technology. And so um, these are things that ultimately norm setting, public policy norm setting governments, and in my view at the international level too, needs to happen as a complement to collective bargaining and social education um, and social dialogue in general. It's like what, like which level should be responsible and, and what you're saying is the way all levels. I, I, I do think, so. I mean, you know, just as, as one example of this, you know, we're having a very vigorous debate in the United States about the question of the entitlement of AI companies to take content that they find um, from various sources on the internet without any kind of permission or authorization from the creators or rights holders and use that to train AI systems. And so obviously there's a bunch of litigation about this. There are very divergent views about what's right. What's fair use and what Absolutely. needs to be compensated. Absolutely, but that, that's gotta be answered and that is a question that's only gonna be answered, in my view, through the public policy s sphere. That's not something that's gonna, I mean, it's been answered in, in individual cases through contract because there have been licenses done. Some AI companies have licensed content for that purpose, but mostly they haven't and they're never all going to do that voluntarily. So it is a question that's gonna to have to be addressed in public I mean, policy. I think that's one of the reasons that things aren't gonna happen as fast as some of these predictions because there's gonna be lawsuits and there's gonna be union activists. <laughs> and uh, yeah, in my industry, the New York Times, um, or one of our rivals just sued OpenAI about their use of, of journalism. So and there's a lot of sand being thrown into the wheels there. It is, and you know, I mean, I have to admit from a labor point of view, I find it's, it's, there's always some irony in this because it's like when I get told by tech companies, big tech companies, that you know, the internet needs to be free and information needs to be free while they maintain you know, non-public uh, you know, sources of their own. They don't release source code to their own AI systems or other things. You know, the, what's good for the goose doesn't always seem good for the gander. You know, there are companies that are suing people that are also themselves deploying AI in aggressive ways as it relates to their own workers and their own, you know, creative talent. So I think it's, it's, it's good for us to take a broader perspective on this and realize that um, in terms of respecting the rights of creative people, creators, and those whose work, even if they're not creative, there's wor their work has gone into what is now being used to build these empires, I think that needs to be taken into account and needs to be fairly addressed. So I sure hope that the litigation process that's going on ultimately reflects that. Can I j jump in on the supply chain question just from another angle? Um, because I, you know, I, 
I sense from the question you're also thinking about low wage workers who are perhaps in other kinds of, even contact center workers could be an example. That's mostly it. Um, I mean, I think one thing is there is the doctrine that of holding uh, companies responsible for their supply chain, uh, human rights due diligence, which is becoming the law across Europe um, and hopefully eventually the United States and hopefully eventually we'll have an international convention on that. But there is supply chain responsibility for human rights and the right to have a union and collective bargaining fall within that remit. So especially Germany is on the front line right now. So Siemens, I'm sure, tell you that they're responsible for at least the first level in their <laughs> supply chain to make sure they have their fundamental rights respected. So part of ESG effectively, right? I mean, in terms of companies being responsible for sustainability and their environmental impact. and But project. it's a law in Germany, so they could be sued if they're not, I mean, or brought, I, you know. But it, it's but it goes it back is, to, the, to the point yeah. we've been discussing. I mean, yeah. you know, for, for, for companies who have the right values, code of conduct guidelines, supplier audits, that is maybe not so relevant, um, but I think it does take, as in sustainability in general, it does take strong institutions as well to secure yeah. that. And, uh, and for Siemens, the numbers are big. Um, our tier one suppliers are 65,000. Um, so 40% of that is customers, uh, actually, as well. Um, but, but of course, you know, the further you go into the upstream value chain, the harder it is um, to really be, um, to, to make sure that we get the right level of visibility, but we do that through supplier audits. Um. Do we have time for one more question? Yes, yes? okay. Thank you, um, Victoria Lee. I'm a public health preventive medicine doctor that's running the second largest health system in Canada. Um, yeah. My question is around, um, you know, I think there's assumptions about how AI technology is going to help us actually get rid of the work that we don't want to do and therefore free up kind of the expertise working at the mm -hmm. highest levels. And I say that with the like review of, if we look at industrial technological revolution thus far and what's happened, it, we humans find ways to do mundane, lazy, or not as productive work, whether it's email, whether it's social media, whether it's other things. We find ways to do that, and sometimes I find in health, we use this all the time, and I've been thinking about it a lot around team-based work. We're trying to get you to work at the highest scope of your um, practice, and eMERGE doctors will come and say, oh, we don't want to just see hard things all the time. We need a bit of a break in mm -hmm. our brain to be able to see mm -hmm. the hard things with some of the easy things, so there's a mix. So I, I wonder about like, that. Is that even a good goal to yeah, have? Like we I sort wonder, of need like, a little I, mental I, break, it's right? It's more of like, is it even a realistic goal? Because I'm concerned that humans have found ways uh, that gives a, give us that kind of break, uh, whether it's, you know, binge watching to social media to all of the things that we current emails, that's not that. I mean, I could say we did a story about call centers and AI, and that's one of the things people said yeah. is, Actually, it's good for us to have like not every task be the hardest task, and we need a mix of tasks. Yeah. So it's a good point. They um, they really like writing up the reports on the calls because it's easier than taking the calls. And one thing AI has done is take away those that report writing because AI can write the report quicker and right. you know easily. And and the workers are saying, but that was like a little break a little from break going needed. from call to call is yeah. having that space to do that. So I mean, I think that's a valid point. And that really comes into productivity and how far you can push people and, yeah, but they do like that. It probably depends also on the nature of your work, you know, and I think this goes to the point yeah. of this is why these things should be customized to the individual workforce and workplace. Because, you know, if you're, if you take, you know, if, if, if I had an AI to take a speech that I wrote and make it into bullet points, I would treasure that as opposed to me having to do that myself. But um, you know, others might not see it the same way, and I think that's one of the things. You know, especially folks who are very, um, you know, devoted to a particular type of career activity and who really want to do that. I'm very familiar with that because most actors are that way, as one example. Um, you know, they obviously don't want the acting job to be taken away by AI. Um, if there are parts of that that can be done um, that are less uh, desirable aspects of that then that might be fine, but you can't take away the core creative core element thing, yeah. because that's really where the passion is. And so I realize not every job is the same, and, and that's why I do think it needs to be so 
um, customized to the particular workforce and workplace. We are at time. Thank you so much. It was so interesting, and I really appreciate everyone's participation. So thank you so much. I hope everyone has a good week. Thank you. Thank you.